Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, good middle of the night to some of you. Um, welcome to the 2015 Kindle UI Spring Release Keynote. We're excited to have you here today. We've got a lot of great stuff to talk about, some amazing things to show you. And we've so, we're so glad that you've taken some time out of your busy schedule to join us today. If I've not met you before, my name is Burke Holland and I work with the developer relations team here at Telerik. You can find me on Twitter at, at Burke Holland and I'd love to hear from you. So please uh, get to tweeting at me. That'd be great. We've got a few thousand folks joining us today for this live webinar, and as usual, anytime we do this and we have this many people on the webinar, some people do inevitably have some problems with the audio or the video. If that ends up being you, don't panic, don't stress, just drop into the Q&A panel there on, the, uh, on your dashboard and let the moderators know. We have people standing by that are here specifically to help you and make sure that you have the best webinar experience possible. Now, if worse comes to worse and you get drug away to work on some other project or you can't make the audio video work for whatever reason, again, it's okay. This entire webinar is being recorded and it's going to be available later today, actually within maybe an hour or two after this webinar, and it's going to be on YouTube in full high definition so you can catch the entire thing at your leisure uh, and get caught up on anything that you might have missed. So no worries there. We've got some great prizes to give away today. We always do this. This is my favorite part. Uh, the legal department has informed me, again, that I am not eligible to win the prizes no matter how many times I register. Unfortunate for me, good for you because you are eligible. Uh, we've got some great prizes. iPhone 6 Plus is uh, being given away today. Up for grabs, we have a Surface Pro 3. These devices are phenomenal. We have several people on the team here that have Surface Pro 3s and they just love them. Another one that we're giving away is the Nexus 6. This is uh, an amazing device the Android counterpart to the iPhone 6 Plus. Uh, just a fantastic device. And then we're doing something that we did last time, which was we're giving away a prize for the best question. Now, if you don't know what this device is, this is an Optima HD 3D projector. This is a legit movie projector in your house. This is an amazing piece of equipment. We're going to give this away today to the person who asked the best, most thought out question. And you can do that in the Q&A panel at any time. And then we'll go through these questions. We'll pick the best one and we'll announce our winner. So have your best question at the front of your mind and make sure that you let us know what it is. We're also giving away a bunch of software today. So we're giving away 10 Kendo UI professional licenses, and we're additionally giving away five of the award-winning UI for ASP.NET MVC licenses uh, that are the MVC counterparts to Kendo UI. And if you're an MVC developer, you definitely want to check out UI for ASP.NET MVC as it really tailors Kendo UI to the MVC experience, making your experience as an MVC developer the best that it can possibly be. To find out about these prizes and when the recording is going to be available, make sure that you follow our official Twitter accounts. You can follow the Kindo UI account at, at Kindo UI, and you can follow the Telerik account at, at Telerik. We've got a lot of amazing things going on, not just on the Kindo UI side, but on the Telerik side as well. So you'll want to stay up to speed on that. And the best way to do that is by following those accounts. And speaking of some of those exciting things, some of you may have heard about a, a product that we recently launched called NativeScript. NativeScript is one of the most aggressive projects we've ever taken on at Telerik. It's been about two years in the making of planning and development and engineering. Um, and we just launched the beta on uh, this last month here in early part of March. Um, NativeScript allows you to build truly native apps with JavaScript. Um, you can get NativeScript on your command line simply by using NPM and installing it, or you can get it inside of the Telerik platform, which is the best way to work with uh, NativeScript as we provide all sorts of tooling inside of Visual Studio, inside of your browser, uh, on the command line, builds it in the cloud for you so that you don't actually have to have a Mac or any SDKs installed. Telerik platform, really the best way to build mobile applications. So check out NativeScript in one of those two places. You can also connect with us on the NativeScript side by following the NativeScript account on Twitter. You can find us on IRC as well. Several of the core team members and NativeScript developers lurk in the NativeScript channel on, on Freenode. And then find us in the Google Groups. If you just search for NativeScript on Google Groups, you can find our group there and go ahead and drop your question in. We're very actively there and watching and taking part with the community, so we'd love to hear from you in any of those places. Another thing that we're announcing this year is that 
First, Telerik US Conference, Telerik Next. This is an exciting event for us. We've never done a US conference before, um, and so this is our first one. It's the Hyatt Boston Harbor Hotel, which is a fantastic place. We've got sessions on Angular, on .NET, on React, on NativeScript, on mobile, on UX design patterns. We have workshops, we have Sitefinity. All of it is gonna be there. This is for Telerik customers, partners, and developers of all flavors. Uh, we'd love to see you at Telerik Next, and we have an exciting keynote from Grant Imahara of the Mythbusters as well. So it's going to be a fantastic conference. If you haven't already, make sure you head over to TellerikNext.com and you get registered uh, while you still can and while we still have some seats available. Now today we're announcing a new Kindle UI that is rocket fuel injected with HTML5 apps that are tailored for any device. And what we mean by that is we've really doubled down on our responsive capabilities in Kindle UI this quarter, uh, adding even more responsiveness to Kindle UI uh, so that you can truly build those applications that work across devices. Now, one of the questions that we get a lot is, how do you guys decide what to put in Kindle UI or what features to work on? And the answer is, you decide. You as the developers tell us what we would, what you would like to see in the framework, and then we put it out there. There's different ways that you do this. One of those places is on our user voice channel. So people come in and they put down features that they would like to see in Kindle UI, and then other folks come in behind them and vote. And when the votes get high enough, we look at these features and we say, these are the features that everybody needs. Let's put these into Kindle UI. So please connect with us, give us your feedback, send us your emails, go through the support channels, hit up user voice. This is the best way to let us know what we can put in Kindle UI that would be most useful for you. Now, first of all, today we're going to have Jen Looper come to the virtual stage to talk to you about some of the new responsive capabilities inside of Kindle UI. Uh, and then next, we're going to have senior developer advocate Cody Lindley come and talk about some of the new export features. And he's got a really cool demo. I've heard about it. Haven't seen it yet. Looking forward to seeing it. And then lastly, we're going to have uh, the lovely John Bristow, our principal developer advocate out there in Australia, come to us uh, at what's about two or three in the morning his time. So we appreciate him being here to talk about some of the new data viz and Gantt stuff that we're, that we're doing as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jen Looper to go ahead and kick things off. Jen, the floor is yours. Thanks, Burke. Hello, everyone. My name is Jen Looper, and I'm a developer advocate at Telerik. And you can follow me on Twitter at Jen Looper. I have a passion for mobile apps and responsive web design, so it's really exciting for me to see all the interesting responsive design and work that Telerik has put into this release. Kendo UI has a long history of being able to handle the needs of many browser sizes. Being responsive actually is part of Kendo UI's DNA. In this part of the webinar, I'm going to talk specifically about what's new in responsive web design for Kendo UI. So, what exactly is responsive web design? Responsive web design is a term coined by Ethan Marcotte in 2010, and its basic premise is that your website needs to look good and perform well on many different devices. And these devices could be any size, from very small screens on basic phones to screen readers for the visually impaired, all the way up to smart TVs and everything in between. Responsive web design is also a technique of building a website for all different sizes of browsers, allowing you to rearrange and resize all your content by using a combination of CSS and HTML markup. And here's a fun fact. The very first website was responsive and looked a little bit like this. Responsive web design is many things, but there are some things it shouldn't be, and one of those is bloatware. You really shouldn't need to write a lot of extra CSS and HTML to show and hide elements of your content on bigger or smaller screens. And it also doesn't have to be slow. Ideally, your responsive site can and should load up on mobile browsers in under three seconds. The new responsive features of Kendo UI widgets are here to help. Let's take a look at five new features that we're delivering in this release to support increasing your site's res responsiveness. Today on the menu, we have two completely new widgets, the Responsive Panel and the Collapsible Widget, which look great on mobile phones, as well as enhancements to the popular and powerful Grid, Chart, Scheduler, and Tree Lists. Let's take a look. First up, the Responsive Panel. To give you a good idea of some of the new responsive capabilities we just released for Kendo UI, I've created a responsive website for an animal shelter. Let's take a look at how one of the new widgets, the Responsive Panel, can really help you lay out your site in an efficient fashion on both web and mobile devices. Here we have some adorable animals listed in the left panel that are ready to find their forever home. If we resize the browser to fit a mobile device, some magic happens. You can already see the way the type rearranges itself, but notice up in the left-hand corner, see the hamburger icon just magically appear? 
That's pretty incredible. It looks even better on a phone, and better yet on a tablet. Let's see how this is done in the code. First, I'm using the Material Design Style Sheets in the head of my HTML to give that nice flat blue color. I added another style sheet to style various elements on this page. You'll notice a media query pertaining to the sidebar. So let's take a look at that sidebar. The layout of the page is essentially made up of a div with ID sidebar and another called main content. We're going to turn that sidebar into a responsive panel and make it open with an icon whose class is KRPanel toggle. The magic, however, all happens in the JavaScript. Here we declare sidebar to be a responsive panel, and we give it a breakpoint at which time it will appear as an element that slides over your main content when its partner hamburger icon is clicked. The responsive panel element is smart enough to know to look for an icon with the class of KRPanel toggle and turn it into a hamburger icon. It's actually pretty cool. You even have some parameters to play with in terms of controlling the look and feel of your sidebar. For example, its width and its orientation. If we change its orientation to right for a right to left page layout, the sidebar automatically switches sides without need for more styling on your end. Very nice. You can see how the responsive panel now slides over, for, over from the right. With a little extra styling, you could put your hamburger icon over to the right as well, and then you'd have a perfect right to left website. Next up, the grid. Let's take a look at the new responsive capabilities of the grid. The Kendo UI grid is um, one of our most popular components, so it's really nice to see it get some more responsiveness. I have here a grid listing the animals who have been adopted from my imaginary pet shelter. When I resize the browser, you notice a few interesting things. First, we start reducing the numbers of columns that are seen. Second, the grid pagination collapses into a dropdown. That's pretty convenient. We can actually control how and when to show or hide the grid columns in the code base. Let's take a look at the code. First, I've included some style sheets in my app, including the flat styles that make this nice color scheme. And then I add a few more styles of my own, not too many, just a few. Next, I include some sample data for my grid. These are just the pets, their owner's names, the pet's age, the owner's address. And then I simply include a div with the ID grid. I initialize the grid in the JavaScript and give it several parameters, creating a sortable, pa uh, pageable grid. And now comes the interesting part. I can set the exact breakpoint in the parameter min screen width where I want this column to show. In this case, I only want the first three columns to show if the width of the screen is 600 pixels or fewer. So I'm going to use a Chrome extension and test whether we're seeing the columns that we're expecting to see. At 600 pixels, we should only see three columns. So let's see what happens. And there they are, mission accomplished. While we're at it, let's resize our browser and take a look at the way the grid looks on a simulator. We only see one column because we set our first column to be the only one to have no min screen width. So Kendo UI knows to show that at 100% width on a narrow screen. It's really very clever. Let's look at the mobile first collapsible widget. The new collapsible widget is a mobile-first widget that looks particularly nice on a phone or on a tablet. Let's see how it works. Here I have some content that I need to compress for mobile phones so that a potential pet adopter can access it ad hoc. It's a great use case for an accordion-style widget like the collapsible widget. In the code, I use the mobile style sheet and declare my collapsible divs to have the data role collapsible. I have a few parameters available that I can add to provide animation for the opening and closing of the widget, and to set it as open initially, or to allow it to remain closed. If we remove the data animation parameter, which was set to false, we open and close a panel with a smooth scroll, which is its default behavior. And if we remove the data collapsed parameter, which was set to false as well, that panel will be closed by default. You can create multiple panels to compress content, and also you can nest content to be collapsed within a collapsible widget. Here we have a form that is nested within a collapsed div.
Here you can see how one div neatly contains a nice form. To use this widget, we don't have to do much in the JavaScript except declare the app as a mobile application and just edit the HTML markup to manage your collapsible divs. The collapsible widget is, very, is a very useful widget for small screens and is a great way to present content when you don't have a lot of space. So, what's new and hot with the scheduler? The powerful scheduler has gotten some responsive love as well. Here we have a scheduler to use if you want to schedule a visit to the shelter to adopt an animal. The scheduler has a lot of really beautiful and useful functionality. There's a full suite of calendar style capabilities so you can manage your schedule with ease. There are also these very nice pop-ups for data entry. But from a responsive point of view, what's new? Well, notice that when I resize the browser, the date is automatically reformatted to shorten for narrower screens. See on the left there? In addition, the buttons on the right resize to form a dropdown. It's very nice. In the code, I'm using the silver style sheet, and I simply declare a div to have the ID scheduler so that I can initialize the scheduler code in my JavaScript file. In the JavaScript, I'm using my regular scheduler code with some schedules fed in for the demo. There's nothing extra for me to write to make these tweaks happen so that the scheduler looks great on a phone or tablet. It all works out of the box. This is turnkey responsive design. Need a responsive chart? We've got you covered. Now I'd like to take a good look at the responsive capabilities of the chart. The Kendo UI chart provides many ways to create beautiful interactive charts that show off your data in a visually engaging way. When I resize the browser window, you see the chart progressively resizing itself and refitting itself to the browser. The technical term is scooching. Each time it resizes, it reanimates itself in a visually pleasing way. Like this. It looks great on a phone. And it looks great on, on a tablet. Let's take a look at the code. Here, I've included the DataViz style sheets, including the DataViz Silver style sheet. I've included my local data, which could also be data from a database or an external API call. And I've added a div with ID chart. My pets data has a slightly different shape from what we've seen before. I simply show the groups of pets with a pet total, something like a group database query. Then, in app.js, I build my chart. This is a pie chart that shows the totals of the pet types. If I change the chart to a line chart, Kendo builds me a nice linear view. Resizing the browser creates the same chart resizing effect. Notice how quickly and efficiently this resize occurs. The animation is real snappy. Changing to a bar chart has the same effect. You can see the power of this visual tool to display your data. Kendo gives you the possibility of really controlling how the chart will look, allowing you to change colors, layouts, and what data you're going to show. So what do I have to do in the JavaScript to make this resizing effect occur? In app.js, I have a function that is triggered when I resize the window. I could get away simply with calling chart.resize, and the resizing would occur whenever the browser's window size changes. But I've added variables to contain my window width and chart, and I'm making the labels rotate a little bit when the window width is less than or equal to 480 pixels. This just gives me a little more room to show my labels. So you see on a tablet the labels are flat, and on a phone they're slightly rotated. The takeaway here is that you have tremendous control over how much or how little to change your charts when your window size hits a certain breakpoint, because the charts are so flexible in their responsive functionality. Last but not least, the tree list. For my last demo, I'm coming full circle back to the Material Design style sheet to show the new responsive elements of the tree list. In this area of my website, I wanted to show the parentage of the pets to show the location of the pet parents and the siblings of the pets after they get adopted. Viewed on a phone or tablet, we again show only some of the columns. Let's see how this is done. This sort of hierarchical data view is perfect for a tree list. The data itself includes a parent ID if the pet is the child of a parent in this list. For example, Fluffy the cat is the child of Ben with a pet ID 9. The markup to create a tree list is quite simple. As usual, we create a div with the ID tree list. Then we build out the JavaScript by creating a schema to shape our data, making pet ID the parameter by which the data is grouped. Setting the model to be expanded ensures that your tree is open by default, and you can display it as closed as well. 
Next, we define TreeList as a Kendo TreeList. We can control the way it behaves on mobile screens by setting the width of the columns we want to show to a specific width. You can see how only the first three columns are shown on a phone. But on a tablet, we're able to see all five. Kendo UI prioritizes the columns that are given specific pixel widths on the narrower screens. I hope you've enjoyed taking a look at the new and interesting responsive elements in this release of Kendo UI. I encourage you to go through the documentation at demos.telerik.com, and in particular visit a website that Telerik produced at demos.telerik.com slash kendo-ui slash responsive to see these enhancements in action. On this website, you can use a QR code to view a sample of a Kendo UI grid, scheduler, chart, or responsive panel on your own device. Take a look. We hope you like what you see. I'm going to pass the mic on to Cody now to discuss some more very cool features of this release. Thanks, Jen. I'm excited to be here. And thank you to everyone for joining us for another Kendo UI webinar. Quickly, uh, my name's Cody Lindley, and I spend most of my time here at Telerik writing about, thinking about, and talking about JavaScript development, um, and specifically Kendo UI development. If any of you guys have any questions about anything I talk about, uh, go ahead and feel free to drop me a message on Twitter or email me. I'll be covering two topics today, and the first topic involves creating documents. If you remember back to the Q3 2014 webinar, we introduced the ability to export widget data to documents. In this release, we've completed the exporting features for all the appropriate widgets, specifically the editor map and pivot grid widgets now all contain logical exporting functionality. Now, given that exporting data from widgets in the form of an image PDF or Excel document was introduced in the last webinar, I'm almost positive you guys get the concept of exporting data from widgets. So I'd like to spend half of the time I have today showcasing the two lower level export functions, save as and draw DOM that make exporting data from a widget possible. The second half of my time, I'll be covering the new grouping and virtualization features added to the autocomplete, combo box, drop down list, and multi select widgets. I've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. Before I demonstrate the lower level functions that make exporting data from a widget possible, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page and show an example of a widget exporting data. As you can see here in the browser, I have a Kendo UI editor widget. And I'm going to add the PDF option, uh, which is new uh, this release to this editor. We'll add here the PDF tool, we'll save. And of course, now you can see we have this PDF button, which allows us to export a PDF. So let's uh, test that out really quick, just to make sure that it works. We'll place a nice little kitten in there, hopefully. Oh, great, there's my kitten. and. Say kittens rock. Change some things around just to make our PDF look a little cool. All right, great. Now we're going to export a PDF. So this exports PDF to the client's computer. And if we look at this, you'll see that it exported the exact data or content I had my in my widget. And this is a uh, this new exporting of data, whether it's PDF or Excel, it's available in several of the logical widgets that we have. And I, I just wanted to make sure everybody understood this before I moved on to the lower level functions. Okay, now I want you to imagine that you are the owner of a site, possibly a site called catmatch.com. And this is naturally a, a place where cats come to date. Now, let's say that you want to give your users of this site the ability to export profiles. Now, this would be a great place where you can use the lower level exporting functions outside of widgets to export data. Let's jump over here to our export demo. I just want to really quickly show all that's going on here. I've just got this export button down here and I'm using the save as function to grab all the text in the document and save it to the client's computer. So let's check that out. If I click export here, I get this Shirley document. If I open it up, what you'll see is all the text from this HTML profile. But HTML is not that great, right? Like we didn't, we got all the text, but what would be really nice if, is if we actually had the images too. So let's get rid of that example, just using the save as. 
Let's incorporate the draw DOM into it. So now I'm, re I'm replacing the functionality of this export button. So we'll save that. Um, and quickly before I show it, what this is doing is it's saying draw the DOM contained within card. And this is a profile card that we have right here. So you'll see it references uh, this card class here and this entire div. And what we're asking is, is that that div be drawn and then we want to do something with that image. Uh, then we want to export that image. So we use the export image function. And then when we're done exporting, uh, what we want to do is we want to save it. So I went ahead and saved that. So now we're going to try exporting an image. And now we, you can see, great. Now we've got our image there. It's a PNG. Um, that could be pretty handy, but maybe you want to give the users the ability of, to use PDFs as well. Well, we have that ability as well with these lower level functions. I'm going to go ahead and replace the event for that button again, and this time we're going to use the draw DOM again. We're going to draw the card, but this time we're just going to use the export PDF function and give it some parameters, and then when it's done, we're just going to save it again. Let's save this. We'll give that a try. Open this up. Great. As you can see, it's it's extremely powerful to have these lower level exporting functions. What this really means is you can use the same functions that the widgets themselves do to export anything you want in the DOM. Next, I want to talk about grouped data. For some time now, you've been able to pass a group option to a data source, and it will actually take one of the fields in the uh, data and group it by that particular field. In this situation, I have um, some data uh, which contains a category of American ales or a category of Belgian and French ales. Now, if I don't turn on the grouping quite yet and show this data in the client, what you'll see is we have 16 um, objects in this array. It's a data source. Uh, you'll see those 16 objects over here. In order to group these a particular way, I just add this group option, um, tell it which field in here I want everything to be grouped by. And then if we look at this data in the client, what we're going to see is it's restructured itself to be grouped under American ales or Belgian and French ales. Now, the part that we're actually releasing uh, in Kendo UI is the fact that some of the widgets can take advantage of this grouping. Uh, one of those widgets is the drop-down widget. So really quickly, I'm just going to disable this again. We're going to look at this widget, and of course, uh, you naturally see just a list of all the data. But if I go back and I turn my grouping on, what we're going to see now is a drop-down list that has groupings, all just by grouping the data source. Uh, one thing I do want to call out here is that as, I, as I'm scrolling this drop-down, it's actually changing this label at the very top, which shows me what data I'm looking at in case the labels that are at the top are off the screen or hidden. It's pretty nice. Now, this, this grouping of data and visually showing it in a widget isn't just limited to the drop-down list. Uh, in this release, it also works with the autocomplete widget. It works with the combo widget and it works with the multi-select widget. So now it's possible uh, to select data that's been grouped and show it grouped for selection. Wow, my time's almost up, so I better get moving. I'm gonna jump over to my last demo. And this is uh, a virtualization demo. Now you might not be familiar with that term, um, but essentially it, maybe you've heard it called infinite scroll or uh, scroll loading. Um, something to that effect. But the idea is is that in some of our widgets that um, have large data sources, especially remote data sources, um, we can download all that data source at one time and show it in a widget. But it can be pretty expensive and an, an, an unnecessary thing. So one of the things that we've added is, for instance, with the drop-down widget, we've added the ability 
to pass this virtual option or virtualization. In order to do this, we also have to give some uh, paging parameters um, and server paging type parameters to the data source. But with this virtual option, what this means is instead of downloading everything at once, it actually downloads it on demand. So if I scroll really fast, what you can you can almost see that loading, but it only loads it when I actually need it. Um, and the whole idea here is, is that we're not loading anything unnecessarily. This is what we call virtualization. Um, it's, it's done in part with this virtual option and this data source option that you see here for the Kendo dropdown list. Now, this is available in the autocomplete widget and a couple of other widgets. Uh, so you're probably gonna see it in more widgets, but it, it's just a performance optimization thing. And with that said, I think that's pretty much it for me. So I'm gonna pass it off to John. Thanks everyone. Thanks a lot, Cody. Those demos were great. Hi everyone, my name's John. For the next few minutes, I'm gonna show you some of the new features we've added to four major widgets of Kendi UI. The grid, the tree list, the Gantt chart, and the chart widget itself. Let's start by talking about the grid. The grid is one of our most popular widgets in Kendi UI. It's great for displaying large amounts of data and it's packed with features. In our latest release of Kendi UI, we've added some things specifically around the grid that I think you're gonna really enjoy. Jen talked about some of the capabilities found in the grid around responsive design. So the responsive capabilities we've added to the grid widget, such as the new pager widget for paging items and the ability to collapse columns when you have a small viewport are really gonna help you when building a responsive website or app. Another feature we've added to the grid is the ability to resize columns by simply double clicking on the resize handle for each column. So in the past, what you've been able to do is simply just walk up to a grid and resize it accordingly. Um, but now what you can do is just simply double click on that and it will automatically uh, shrink to the contents of the column. I know it, it sounds simple, but it really speaks to some of the work we're doing around the user experience and little refinements like this help. In the previous release of Kendi UI, we added a lot of features around exporting the data that's displayed to PDF. Uh, so PDF is a really important document format for a lot of businesses. And with the grid, uh, one of the challenges we faced with this was obviously when you go to export data in a paged view, you would typically only just get one page showing up. So you can see we've got 100 items here, um, but if we go ahead and scroll through this, which we can't, we can only see the first five. So how do we fix this? Well, we've added a new feature to the PDF options, uh, which is called an all pages property. By setting that to true and um, refreshing our page here, what this allows us to do is now navigate through all the items in our data set or our data source rather, and export those to PDF. Now, be aware that if, you're, if you've got a lot of items in your bound to your data grid, um, you're going to generate a large PDF, but um, it does generate a PDF with all of those items listed. So this turns out to be really nice because um, obviously when you're, you know, I've got these things in a, in a page view, you want to be able to see them all. So one of the ways in which you can um, help yourself when doing an export to PDF is there's a library that we include that you can, you can utilize called the Paco library. This is a, um, library that ships as part of Kendi UI. And what this will do is basically save you um, a lot of work in terms of compressing the PDF as it comes from the proxy URL if you're using a proxy. We've added also some refinements to the way our PDF export functions operate. So for example, now we provide a promise for progress, error, and completion events when either saving or exporting your data to PDF. And here's a tip, if you're gonna use these, um, you can use them in a, in a really rich and meaningful way to provide visual updates to your users. We do that automatically with the grid, but sometimes users like to get notifications in other forms. Another feature we've added is the ability to filter on grids. So filtering is a, a big feature of the grid. And with this feature, you can you know, filter data through a set of refined operations. Um, these are everything from you know, Boolean values to uh, checks against strings, etc. 
Um, in this release, what we've done is, is we've added support for what's called multi-checkbox filtering in the grid. So let's see how this works. I'm going to navigate back to my script here, and I'm going to specify that my grid is filterable. Now, when I do this, um, what ends up happening is we just get these little icons appearing, and I can go ahead and specify these Boolean operations to check to see if you know there's a criteria that matches um, that filter. So what I might want to do is have a list auto-generated for this purpose. And for that, we can um, simply add the ability to do multiple um, checkbox options on the individual columns. So the way we can do this is we just simply navigate up to our columns collection here. And let's say we want to add a filter uh, for our uh, countries, our list of countries here. So we'll go ahead and say multi equals true. And by specifying that, what that will end up doing is it will auto-generate for us a, that, that, that list that I spoke to earlier for the country itself. So if we go ahead and refresh this page now, what we should see in our filter is now that, that list of multiple items that I can pick from. So this is auto-generated based on the items that uh, were bound to the column. And if I go ahead and specify a filter, you can see we get that reflected in our UI. So really, really nice feature. Um, finally, another feature that uh, users have been asking for is the ability to quickly and easily take the data within the grid and then utilize it in other applications. So a feature we've just added is the ability to export data from the grid into, for example, a spreadsheet application like Excel. Um, now, in the past, we've been able to export to an Excel file, but this is different. What we want to do here is the, the ability to basically copy and paste into Excel itself. So let's see how this works. I'll navigate back to my configuration. And what I would like to do here is there's a couple of properties that I'm going to go ahead and specify. The first property I'm going to specify is this one called allow copy. This is basically configuring the grid to say I can copy cells in the grid to the clipboard. Um, the other thing I might want to do uh, in this case is say selectable, specify the selectable property. And I'll go ahead and say that this is multiple cell. So this will allow me to select multiple cells at once. So if we go ahead and refresh now, what I can do, oh, looks like I have a little problem here. Let me go ahead and make sure I add that column, comma rather. And now if I go ahead and refresh, now I can do, what I can do here is I can select, you know, multiple columns here if I wanted to, and I can hit command C to copy that into the clipboard. If I go ahead and fire up Excel, for example, I can now go ahead and dump this into a spreadsheet application. So there you go. Now it's important to note that we support both CSV and TSV, that is comma separated values and tab separated values. You can control that through a format property on the grid itself. Um, so that turns out to be really, really nice. So good stuff there. All right, so next up is the tree list. So the tree list is a widget that we first introduced in the last release of Kendi UI after it had become the number one voted item on our feedback portal. This thing was um, desperately needed by customers. You can kind of think of this as like a supercharged hybrid widget. It combines the features of the tree view that you see here on the left with uh, features found in the grid. So we have things like columns and all the, all the great stuff that's uh, available in the grid. So it's got this structure and it's really useful for viewing hierarchical data. In the earlier demo, Jen showed the new responsive capabilities of the tree list. So much like the grid widget, the tree list now supports targeting smaller viewports. And so if you're targeting, again, responsive design, this is a great new feature we've added. We've added some other features, however, around specifically the columns um, to lock, resize, and reorder them. And configuring this stuff is turns out to be pretty simple. So let's assume that I've got this structure here and I want to go ahead and say, for example, um, uh, I want to lock some of these, these columns. So let's go back here and we'll navigate over to my solution here for the tree list. Um, you can see I've got my configuration here. It, there's a lot of configuration that goes into the tree list itself. Um, but the way in which we can set this up is for the tree list itself, um, let's go ahead and specify that we want to um, specifically uh, reorder some of the comment, uh, columns or, or make them resizable. So the first thing we're going to do is specify that we want to resize our columns. That's, that's pretty simple to do. So we just specify resizable uh, true. And then if we want to be able to reorder these columns, we can say reorderable, which is a, a mouthful, 
uh, true. Let's just go scroll back, refresh, and see what this does. So if we go ahead and expand, um, you can see that we can reorder these columns here, which is great. Uh, we can go ahead and resize these if we want as well. And, um, you know, th this turns out to be a nice feature, obviously, when, when users are wanting to use this. Um, another feature that we may want to do is add a column menu. So just navigating back here, you can see we have this filter built in, but maybe we want to use a column menu uh, that allows me to do other operations. So let's see how we can do that. So back in my tree list here, what I'm going to go ahead and do is specify column menu equals true. So let's see what change that does. We'll go ahead and refresh. And now you'll see that instead of those filter items, we see that we have this drop down column uh, menu that we can we can perform operations against. So things like sort ascending, descending, etc. I can enable or disable columns and I can also specify filters. Um, this turns out to be really, really nice because when we go to, for example, lock columns, this will actually help us do so uh, through this menu. So let's see how we can do that. So locking columns turns out to be pretty easy. Um, we can do this on the individual columns themselves. So we can specify, for example, that this first uh, column is indeed locked. And if we go back to our view here, um, you can see that if we go ahead and expand our items rather, um, you know, you can see that uh, if I had a smaller viewport here, for example, uh, let's go ahead and shrink this guy down. Um, you can see that that first column is indeed locked. So that's that's a nice feature that we have there available to us inside of the tree list. Um, if I wanted to go to the column uh, menu now, you can see I can specify other columns that I wish to lock. And what this will do is simply lock them against the uh, locked column that I've already specified, that first one that you see there. So the tree list itself um, has added a lot of features around columns. And they're super configurable and uh, turns out to be really, really nice going forward. So let's now switch gears and talk a little bit about the Gantt chart. The Gantt chart is one of our most action-packed widgets. It's, there's a lot of engineering that's gone into this thing. And realistically, widgets like the Gantt chart are really more of an entire solution than a simple widget. Uh, there's all kinds of things going on here. You've got a tree list. You've got um, our, our drawing APIs at work here. You've got... Uh, the ability to organize tasks, move them around. There's a lot of interaction going on here. In the latest release of Kend UI, we've added some great new features to the Gantt chart. So up first is support for right-to-left languages. So um, as you know, accessibility is a big deal on the Kend UI team. We want to make sure that all of our widgets support the broadest number of users, whether that means supporting things like Section 508 or ARIA attributes or high-contrast themes. Uh, we, want, we want to make sure that's a first-class citizen. Incidentally, all of our controls in Kendi UI out of the box do support right to left. And now with Gantt, uh, with the Gantt chart, this is the, the latest uh, widget to support it. So th the way that we can get this to work is by going back to our, um, our code here. You can see this is the description for the Gantt itself. Um, there's really two key things that you need to do. Um, whether you know it or not, there's this style sheet that we include, um, which I'll go ahead and uncomment here, which is called kendo.rtl.min.css. Uh, this is our right to left support. And by including this in your list of styles, um, you simply enable that support to happen. Now, um, if you go ahead and do this and just hit refresh, nothing really is gonna change there. And the reason for that is because you actually have to set an element on the containing element, uh, sorry, an attribute on the containing element. So on this div here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna specify a class and that class is going to say k-rtl. So when you say that, what this is informing the widgets that are contained within it is uh, I need to support right to left. And so if we go back now and we refresh, you can see that our view has now changed to that right to left view. Um, so if you're utilizing languages like Arabic or Hebrew or other right to left languages, this is a big, big deal. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a great feature going forward for the Gantt. Uh, a critical aspect of planning through the Gantt chart is of course, resource management. So uh, resources are often the sort of restricted uh, or constrained resources that you have like people and, and other sorts of critical resources in your organization for planning out tasks. And one of the things we've done is given you the ability to configure the data source for your resources. So what this allows you to do is you can simply go into a task now and assign resources 
to those individual tasks, uh, which turns out to be really, really nice. We've had some other subtle nuances to the Gantt as well. So for example, if you, as you may have noticed, as you hover your, your mouse over uh, a particular item on uh, the, the scheduler here, you can see we get this nice tooltip being shown. Um, so features like this are, are really great and uh, really help with the user experience going forward with the Gantt chart. Another feature we've added to the Gantt chart is subtle. It's uh, more around the user experience. It's a visual indicator that will show you the current date time. It's just a red line that we show. So if you're planning out these, these tasks, uh, you can see where is the current date time in conjunction to them. So that's a nice thing. So last but certainly not least is the chart. So uh, the chart itself is an integral part of Kendi UI. And since the very beginning, it's, it's been um, you know, one of my favorite widgets that we've had available. So um, there's all kinds of different charts available. There's area charts, there's bar charts, bubble charts, donut charts. We support SVG, we support HTML5 Canvas. Um, they're responsive, they support themes, they're really, really great. And I really like the chart because it's super powerful. It makes me look really good as a developer. I'm not a, I'm not a great designer, but using the Kendi UI charts, um, I can fool people into thinking I know something about design. With the latest release of Kendi UI, we take the chart to a whole new level. Um, so there's been some incremental improvements we've made to the chart in terms of realigning legends, and we have APIs now, new APIs for the axis and, and so forth. But the one area I wanna focus on here is a feature we've added to the chart called custom visuals. So this is a brand new feature that's really exciting and one that I think a lot of you are gonna use going forward. So to understand what a custom visual is, you have to understand that the chart has a number of built-in default representation for things like you know the series data or the axes label, uh, or various other things with you know the different charts that you might use. And sometimes you wanna change the way these things look. Uh, maybe I might want to make the series data here appear three-dimensional, or perhaps I'm interested in adding some images to my chart. And that's where a custom visual comes in. A custom visual allows you to effectively redefine the way a chart can look. So what are these things? Well, they're really quite simple. They're, they're basically bits of code that allow you to define custom drawing routines. And so what, what happens is, is Kendo UI comes along and says, you know, okay, Kendo chart, you've got um, a bunch of these custom visuals defined. What these custom visuals do is they set up a scene for drawing uh, to the screen. So in this example here, I have a chart that is basically displaying data for countries, and it's not terribly interesting. So what I might like to do is override some of the, the sort of default visuals that appear there with some of my own. So I'm going to go ahead and define a set of labels, and in particular, I'm going to define this visual here. A visual is a property that takes a function, and the first parameter of that function is uh, something that, that gives you access to things like um, in this case, it's, it's contextual. So I'm, I'm utilizing uh, properties of the label itself. So the rectangle that it's drawn in, the text value of the label, and other attributes as well. And what I can use that, those attributes for is to do some interesting things. So what I'm doing here is I'm utilizing the geometry and drawing APIs found in Kendi UI to construct that visual scene to redraw all of those categories that you saw on the left-hand side here. So all of these all of these country names here I wanna replace with their country flags. So I've already gone ahead and downloaded those country flags. And what I'm doing here is I'm basically drawing images of those flags in line with the chart itself. And this is done using those APIs and we'll render it as part of that. So let's go ahead and save this change now. And we'll refresh the page here. So that looks pretty good. We've gone ahead and taken those country names and replaced them with their equivalent flag. So next, I you know, I may want to go ahead and override the s some other visuals here. Like, so for example, I've got these labels here and I may want to override how those things work. So going back to my code here, let's go into the series property and particularly we're going to define another visual for, for that series. So what I'm doing here is I'm returning um, some text and I'm positioning it absolutely. I don't recommend that you do this, but um, we have APIs for layout and such, but I just wanted to keep this simple. So what I'm doing here is I'm specifying some text that I want to display, but I'm doing it in line within uh, the chart itself. So let's go back to 
our chart now. And if we hit refresh, you can see now those labels show up as, you know, big, bold letters on our page. And this is really, really nice because this looks really, you know, looks a lot better and is more contextual to the user. So as you can see, custom visuals give you a lot more control over how your charts are drawn to the screen. So you might wonder, you know, where can I define these custom visuals? Are they, are they just, you know, labels and such? It turns out lots and lots of different places. In fact, with this latest release of Kendo UI, I can't think of an element of the chart that you can't change with a custom visual. Now, um, as you start looking into this, you can tweak pretty much any part of the chart. And this is really great news for our customers who are looking to create stunning charts for their apps. That about wraps it up for me. I hope you're as excited as I am about these great new features in Kendo UI. And I look forward to hearing from you um, about some of the things that you'll be using. Burke, over to you. Thank you, John. Man, those were some great demos. I get to see those at the same time as you do, so I don't actually see them beforehand, believe it or not. So I always love to watch this thing come together in the end. Really exciting for us. I want to take a minute and talk about one of the most requested features that we've ever gotten specifically in regards to license holders of Kindle UI Professional, and that is surrounding package managers. So there's different package managers out to bring uh, different libraries into your web projects, and they make it a lot easier than having to go out and download a package and unzip it and then move it into a, a folder somewhere. And so a lot of these are commonly known as Bower, um, there's NuGet, there's a couple others, but Bower and NuGet are the two that we see the most. And we're very pleased today to announce that Kendo UI Professional is now available on Bower today. That's right. This is one of the most requested features we've had ever. And I want to show you really quickly how this works and, and how we've implemented it because you can now grab Kendo UI Professional without ever leaving your command line. So let's take a look at how to do that. Now, the first thing you're going to want to do to get Bower working is to head over to docs.kindoui.com to get the instructions on how to get to the secured profession, Kindle UI professional Bower endpoint. Now, once you get there, you can just type in Bower into the search box and it'll bring up this nifty window uh, with the link directly to the article. Now, in the article, it'll talk about how to get Kindle UI core, which is public. Uh, that's not a professional package, so you can grab that at any time. Um, and then if you scroll down a little bit further, it'll have the endpoint for Kindle UI Pro. Now, you want to copy this here and then let's head back to the command line. I'm going to go ahead and create a new uh, application and I'm going to move into that directory and then once I'm in that directory I'm going to go ahead and install this package from Bower. As you can see it's asked me for my credentials and I'll put those in. This is connecting directly to our Bower server and it's giving you back uh, Kindle UI Professional. So this is going to be pulled back from our server. Now let's open this up in Sublime Text here real quick. So I'm going to go ahead and open this. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and look at the project structure. And you can see this app folder was created, components, and inside we have jQuery and Kindo UI. And if we drill in further, you can say we've got kindo.all.min right here. And that's the kitchen sink. You can see Sublime trying to load that bad boy up there. Uh, and then down at the bottom, we have files like uh, Kindo UI Web. So all of the files that you would expect in Kindo, Kindo UI Professional right here, right from Bower, without you having to go and download anything. Really, really neat stuff here. Um, if you're wondering about credentials here, there's a couple different ways. You can add a dependencies uh, entry in order to sort of uh, get around this so you don't have to uh, put in that long URL. And you can also add a netrc file. And this netrc file allows you to download without having to put your credentials in. So I could create a netrc file and then go ahead and begin to fill this out, put my credentials in. Not going to do that because uh, then everybody would see it. But this will allow you to use Bower and the secure Bower endpoint without having to enter your username and password. Great for production servers. So that's Kindle UI Professional on Bower. And now I know a lot of you are thinking, well, what about NuGet? Where's NuGet? NuGet is coming soon. We're working on it right now. We've got the server set up. We've got all of the infrastructure. We're just doing some final testing and making sure that everything is good on our side to support the amount of downloads on your side. So again, follow those Telerik and Kindle UI Twitter accounts to find out when that stuff is coming out because it's coming your way very, very soon. 
Now, last quarter, we announced a brand new material design theme. There's a lot of these UX frameworks that are coming out that help you build apps that look consistent and are uniform. And we want to help you do that. We want Kindle UI to be able to fit into these UX guidelines. You shouldn't have to sacrifice functionality to have the look and feel that is required for your application. And another one of those is SAP Fiori. So SAP Fiori, for those of you who don't know or don't work on SAP, is another UX guideline, set of UX guidelines that allow SAP developers to build applications that all look and feel the same so that everyone who uses your application will be familiar inside the bounds of that app. And that's why today, another thing we're announcing is a brand new Kindo UI for SAP Fiori. So this is a, a new theme for our widgets that allow the widgets to look and feel like they should and like they, you would expect them to inside of a Fiori application. So here's something like the grid. This is the grid with the new Fiori theme. Of course, we've applied that to all areas of Kindo UI, including things like the scheduler. So you have this robust functionality that you can now lay on top of your SAP systems and deliver this right in the browser. These are things like the pivot grid, things like the tree grid, the tree list fantastic widgets that are now available look like your SAP applications. Uh, we've also extended this to Kindo UI Mobile. So if you're looking to build mobile applications that comply with the Fiori UX guidelines and you're in, you're in sort of those constraints, we've got that for you. Uh, and if you are an SAP developer, I do encourage you to go to the store.sap.com and just do a search for Telerik. And we've actually put a sample mobile application out there for you. Just click that demo now button. You can grab that. You can take a look at that, see how we put that together and how you can connect to your NetWeaver gateway systems as well today. Now remember Kindo UI Core, always free and open source on GitHub. This is our uh, Kindoka cat, Octocat here icon that the design team drew up for me. I just love this. Make sure that you go out and grab that. There's over 23 or some odd widgets out there plus the entire framework. This is a great place to get started. It's completely free. There's no commitment. Just all the widgets that you need to get you started. And when you find yourself needing those solution grade widgets like the grid or the scheduler, or some crazy data viz, we're right there with you with Kindo UI Professional. You can upgrade at any time from core to professional when you need that functionality. Lastly, I want to point you back to the demos that we have online. Everything that we've talked about today is available in interactive format on our demos on our site. Additionally, when you download a trial, if you click the Try Now button up in the corner, you'll get all the demos in the Try Now zip file in the package. So you're getting all that code. You can see how we've put all these things together. Additionally, if you scroll down on any demo to where the code is, you'll see this Edit This Example button. And this will open the demo inside of the Kindo UI Dojo, which is a interactive live coding environment where you can actually tweak the code uh, and run it yourself. It's a great place to start off if you're just learning how to use some of these more complex widgets. So we definitely encourage you to check that out. So head on over to kindoui.com. That's really the only thing left for you to do to grab everything that we've announced today. It's all ready for you today. Uh, you grab a trial, check in your account if you're already a Kindle UI, Kindle UI customer, uh, and make sure that if you're not and you're looking for an open source project to get started with your next responsive web application to uh, check out uh, Kindo UI Core on GitHub, but you can find that at kindoui.com as well. So we will see you over there. So lastly, we want to get to the Q&A and we'll go through some of these questions. Remember, if you haven't got your question in yet, there's still time to win this amazing projector so that you can uh, you can watch your favorite movies or play your video favorite video games in full scale, taking up an entire wall of your living room, which frankly, let's be honest, is awesome. So with that, you're going to hear a little bit of a break as we hop over to the live Q&A. Uh, stay tuned and we will talk to you in just a couple seconds. <laughs> 